Encircled by mountains, the capital of Bavaria is located north of the Austrian border, about 100 kilometers from Salzburg, on a fertile plateau. Whether arriving by train, airplane, or on one of the famous German motorways, it's easy to reach the heart of the city. Transportation is organized with German precision and is quick and comfortable. Hauptbahnhof is like a town within the city, with shops, services, and snack bars, where even time spent waiting can be spent pleasantly. The hall of the main station receives both domestic and foreign trains. Many trains come into Munich from neighboring towns and villages as commuting is common and the use of public transport widespread. Perhaps this is the reason why the commercial quarter of Munich developed relatively close to the station. In addition to Hertie, Kaufhof, and other large department stores, many smaller food and clothes shops, toy shops, technical shops, and bookstores, as well as restaurants and beer cellars can be found next to each other. Large shopping centers have not killed the business of traditional stores and small shops here. Among modern buildings, the huge block of the Palace of Justice stands out, opposite Karl's door. The masterful work of Friedrich von Tiersch mixes Renaissance elements with Baroque shapes. Opposite, between two stores, is the House of Artists, a work of Gabriel von Seidel from the turn of the century. A many-storied shopping center has been built under the square. The intricate system of underpasses here connects to the underground. Symmetrical semicircular buildings surround Karlsplatz and its fountain. The most well-known pedestrian zone starts from here, where Neuhauserstrasse becomes Kaufingerstrasse and leads to the main square, Marienplatz. Karl's Tor, or Charles Gate, located here, was the western gate of the city in 1315. Prince Karl Theodor of Bavaria gave his name to the square and the gate. Looking at the map, we can see how big the city core was under the reign of Ludwig the Bavarian and how much the modern Munich has expanded today. When Karlsplatz has become one of the most well known intersections and meeting places. The pedestrian zone is absolutely full of people in winter and summer alike. If the weather is good, the terraces of the restaurants fill up, and street sellers offer vegetables and fruit, newspapers, lottery tickets, or even Bavarian souvenirs, beer mugs, or other objects with the typical white and blue Bavarian colors. Going towards Marienplatz, the number of older houses increases. At one time, the Society of Town Citizens held its meetings on the upper floor of one of the two-story chapels called Burgersaal. The hall was planned by Viscardi in 1710. Its walls are decorated with real masterpieces, a relief of the Annunciation, and a painting entitled Group of Guardian Angels. Some of the houses were already guest houses when built centuries ago. In the heat, cold water drops from the Salome Fountain are refreshing. It was made by Hans Wimmer in 1962 in memory of Richard Strauss, a great son of Munich. The ceramic shapes represent the figures of the opera Salome. The Michaeliskirche, the cathedral of the Order of Jesuits, stands modestly behind the fountain. The Dutch master builder Friedrich Sustris took the Ilgezo church in Rome as a model. The Renaissance statues and stucco ornamentations are the works of Hubert Gerhardt. He also made the figure of Saint Michael fighting a dragon, which is standing in the wall cabinet of the main facade. 
more than 30 members of the Wittelsbach family are buried in the crypt. At the corner of the Hirmer closed store building, a stone statue with a small tower in its hand may be seen. The so-called Nice Tower, or Kalfinger Gate, formerly situated here, was the western border of the city during the time of Heinrich der Löwe, meaning Henry the Lion. Hunting is a popular pastime in Bavaria, which is full with forests. The German Hunting and Fishing Museum is located in the former church of the Order of Augustine. A huge bronze wild boar calls her attention to the entrance of the museum. Richly blooming geraniums make the house windows more cheerful. Perhaps the most well-known building of Munich is the twin-towered Cathedral of Our Blessed Lady, in German, Frauenkirche. The towers with their typically rounded domes can be seen from nearly everywhere. The biggest medieval German master builder, Jörg Ganghofer, rebuilt the original Romanesque church into Gothic style from 1468. Around this time, almost all big construction projects lasted for decades. Here it's explained with a nice story. A big black footprint can be seen behind the main entrance. Legend has it that it was the devil's footprint who couldn't take the master away until the building had been finished. However, seen from our viewpoint, the building still hasn't been finished, with windows still missing, covered by a colonnade. The crypt of Bavarian Louis and that of Louis III, who was the last of the Wittelsbach dynasty, are located in the chapels. Germany's largest hall church is 99 meters high. Those 46 wooden statues representing apostles and prophets, which were originally leaning out of columns, are exhibited in the sanctuary. The works from the 15th century originate from Erasmus Grasser's workshop. Also, the valuable stained glass windows could be protected against the bombing in World War II. On the square in front of the church, a bronze model of the Munich downtown area can be found. This is a gesture aimed to help the blind and those with weak eyesight. The model helps even those who have good eyesight to find the way to the city hall. The new city hall in the main square was built by Georg Haubiriser at the turn of the 18th to the 19th centuries. The huge neo-Gothic palace has six inner courtyards. The statues of the lavishly decorated facade represent Bavarian kings, prince electors, and allegoric and legendary figures. In Europe's fourth largest carillon, 43 bells play four different melodies. One curiosity of the 85-meter-high tower is the puppet show structure. At 11 o'clock each morning, the figures recall the tournament held on Prince William V's wedding in Lanshut. We can see court jesters and trumpeters, and then jousting knights appear. After them, the representatives of the medieval crafts guilds dance, and finally the cock crows, his call mingling with the noise of the city. According to German tradition, there's a beer cellar in the city hall, and as the building is so big, there are even two. In the vaulted cellar of the Ratzkeller, there's live music in the afternoons, but we can sit outside in the pleasant inner courtyard where Gothic gargoyles stare down at us. The other such restaurant is the Glockenspiel, which means Carillon Café and is also a cocktail bar with international flavors. In the middle of the square stands the Marienzäule, or Marian Column, erected to celebrate the end of Swedish occupation. Red Gerhard made the 11-meter statues of red marble consisting of a charming Madonna and four allegoric figures. The old city hall closes the eastern end of Marienplatz. Going toward the Viktualienmarkt, our site is attracted by two church towers. The history of the Holy Ghost and Peter Church leads back to the times when Munich was founded. 
In 1158, Prince Henry the Lion established a bridgehead at the bank of the Isar River, and this is considered the core of the city. The prince collected taxes after the salt cargoes, and these gave him a huge income. He established a mint and a market, and on the former place of a small chapel, he had the Peter Tower built, which is the oldest religious building of the city. The Rosenthal Street was at some point a moat. The angular Lion Tower stands as a memory of the old city wall, which had been built by the prince bearing the same name. Rosenthal leads to the Victualian Markt, the vegetable market. Traditionally, the carnival season starts here, at this market, when the market women dressed in colorful clothes begin to dance to the music of wind instruments. The colorful bustle of the market is thrilling. Not only vegetables and fruits are sold here, but flowers, meat, fish, and baked goods. Pretzels and rolls are offered in the small pavilions. Bavarian white sausages, labriquets, and ham hocks are baked. Mugs of beer from one of the many Bavarian breweries can be had. The spotlight is on roasted meats and sausages, but those on a diet can eat fish and salad or drink a glass of freshly pressed fruit juice. There's no light version of beer, but for drivers, there are alcohol-free varieties. Regardless of what kind of beer we drink, we can buy a decorated mug in several varieties. Few tourists go home from here without buying a tin-lidded ceramic stein decorated with colorful Bavarian motifs. It's also possible to buy meat here, not just eat it. Bavarian butchers make not only brilliant sausages, but also prepare meat splendidly for preparation at home. The place of Max Josef Platz was originally a cemetery, which was terminated by the Bavarian king Max Josef, whose statue is now standing in the middle of the square. Two theaters and a museum can be found on the square. The Staatsoper is also called the National Theater. The world premiere of three of Wagner's operas was held in this Greek-styled building with its columns and tympanums. The Residence Theater, planned by Cuvier, was destroyed in the bombing of World War II. The building of the present glass facade modern theater was begun in 1948. King Ludwig I had the Königsbau built as a copy of the Florentine Pitti Palace. The Castle Museum, the Treasury, and the Money and Coin Collection are located here. Königsbau is just a small part of the huge block of the residence. The Bavarian rulers have always been great supporters of the arts, and they also had no lack of money. The Bavarian royal residence got its present eclectic form by being formed by the most outstanding artists of the various ages, according to the ruler's taste. The Renaissance, Baroque, and Rococo are mixed in it but it also has neoclassic elements. Alta Residence is the name of the western part of the building block. Bronze lions guard its main entrance. Its huge square courtyard is the Alter Hof. Its facade is covered with false architectural elements. Between its two gates is the statue of the patron saint of the Bayou Vars in a marble niche. The Bayovars are Germanic tribes who were chased away from the territory of the Czech Republic in the age of great migrations and were probably the ancestors of the majority of the present Czech, Austrian, and Bavarian population. If we compare the customs, temperaments, and tastes of these people, the similarities are obvious. 
The Feldherrnhalle, or Field Marshal's Hall, is modeled on an Italian building, the Loggia de Lanzi, in Florence. Under the arcaded archways of the building that is open from three sides, the statues of two very different people may be seen, a military hero, Count Johann Tilly, and the notorious intriguer, Prince Karl Philipp von Vrede. The hall is guarded by dignified lions. The Teatiner Church was built from the donations of Elector Ferdinand Maria and his wife, Henrietta Adelaide of Savoy. The church stands opposite the residence and reflects Italian and French influence and is also reminiscent of the Mother Church of the Teatinus Order in Rome. The Frenchman Cuvier shaped the work of the two Italian masters, Barelli and Zuccali, into its present form. Maximilian Emmanuel sent for the young man from France as court dwarf, but there was considerable artistic ambition in the small man. His master had him educated in Paris and later appointed him as his court architect. The avenue, named after Ludwig I, Ludwigstrasse, begins from Odeonsplatz. Ludwig's motto was chiseled into the pedestal of a statue of him, to govern fairly and steadily. We're still a ways from the part of town called Schwabing, which is the art quarter of Munich, but we can also find artists, draftsmen, caricaturists, and organ grinders around the Breuhaus. This instrument of the street has practically died out in most of Europe, but it can provide a good atmosphere wherever it's heard. The typical Bavarian brass band is an absolutely integral part of the atmosphere in Bavarian beer cellars. Platzl is a part of the Breuhausstrasse where Bavarian folklore performances are shown every day. According to tomb findings, beer was already made in ancient times, but hops has been used only from the 12th century. Brewing started in the German country monasteries at approximately this time. Beer is made of barley malt, hops, and water. The quality of these three basic elements determines the color, taste, and smell of the beverage. The sugar content of the liquid, made of the basic materials, starts to ferment. Fermentation lasts for 6 to 14 days at 5 to 6 degrees Celsius. The liquid becomes real beer during aging. At this time, it becomes saturated with carbon dioxide. Afterwards, it's poured into barrels and bottles. Opposite Platzl is the most famous beer cellar in town, the royal brewer Hofbräuhaus. Good quality Bavarian beer has been made and sold here since 1589. First it belonged to the Duke, later becoming royal property, and since 1852 it's been owned by the state. Hofbräuhaus can presently accommodate 6,000 people. Not only tourists visit here, there are a lot of regular customers who are served with their own beer mug. The numbered mugs are waiting in padlocked crates for their owners to use them. Of course, besides beer, brandy is also served, and there's no lack of delicious Bavarian food specialties. For instance, we can eat soup with liver dumplings, garlic soup, Bauernschmaus, which is fried pork, ham and sausages with dumplings and steamed sauerkraut, crisp knuckle of pork with skin-like glass. The pretzels are simply one of a kind, but the homemade lip tower and cheese plates are also of top quality. Marillenknödel, namely dumplings with apricots, are served as dessert. The original Bavarian foods followed by a good beer cannot be called a diet, but are especially delicious and consider the motto on the t-shirt sold in the beer cellar. Beer formed a diesen wunderschönen Körper. That is, beer has formed this exquisite body. In the shop, we can buy original HB mugs, glasses, bottle openers, and even aprons. The building was extended and rebuilt several times. Now it looks as if Littmann and Mason had dreamed it up at the end of the 19th century. In 
In summer, its huge arcaded garden is open to the public with shady chestnut trees and a lion fountain. The same artists worked on the royal courtyard as whose works we can find all over the world. Hubert Gerhardt, Wilhelm von Kalbach, Hans Kromper. The courtyard is part of the famous English garden. Originally, it was a marshy flood area of the Isar River and was drained in 1802. In the western annex of the residence, an Egyptian exhibition is on display. In front of the garden facade of the building, the original obelisk is standing, which Napoleon had originally wanted to put on the Place de la Victoire, but it was not delivered from Munich. In the middle of the Hofgarten is the rounded Temple of Diana that was damaged in the war, but has been reconstructed. The statue on its top is a true copy of Hubert Gerhardt's destroyed work. The green lawn surrounded by flowers is a favorite place for people to have their lunch on weekdays and at weekends Munich locals come here for a picnic and of course foreigners have also discovered it. The courtyard is bordered by a covered arcade from the north and west. Under the arcades, there are the Theater History Museum and the arched gate opening to the inner courtyard of the residence. In the courtyard decorated with a fountain, concerts are held during the summer. The entrance of Europe's nicest Rococo theater, the Cuvier, opens from here. The garden is open to the public from both the inner and outer sides of the entrance to Odeonsplatz. Munich's river, the Isar, divides the city in two. Prince Regentenstrasse and the similarly named bridge lead to the statue of the Peace Angel. The bridge was constructed in 1890, but soon a flood destroyed it, so it had to be totally rebuilt. By announcing the competition, Munich wished to pay tribute to the happy 25 years past since the conclusion of peace in 1871. The work consists of several styles and was designed by three architects and sculptors, Hallmeyer, Duhl, and Petzold, who needed four years for the work. Decorative stairs and a fountain are placed in front of the statue standing on a column. The statue and the hall decoration have been regilded in recent years, perhaps in order to remind us of the more or less peaceful years since the end of World War II. University students like to sit and study among the columns, while lovers sit on the park benches in front of the fountain. There are several parks along the riverbank. Along the side of the Maximilianeum, there's a large, gently sloping green area with benches and good bicycle paths. A romantic bridge spans the small stream running into the Isar. The arrangement of the Maximilianstrasse is similar to that of the Prince Regentenstrasse, but here the memorial is standing on the left side of the Isar, and after the bridge, the road goes round a semicircular palace. The building of the Maximilianeum was started in 1857, according to plans of Burkline and Semper, in neo-Renaissance style. 
It was built to be a dormitory where, according to the ruler's plans, the most talented sons of Bavaria could live during their university studies. Since 1949, the dormitory has only been operating in the back annex, while the building itself is the house of the National Assembly. Palace Athens' nearly six-meter-high stone statue guards the Izar Bridge. The monument of Maximilian II is the work of Kaspar von Zumbusch. It's doubly allegoric. On the base, there are figures representing peace, science, power, and truth. And above them is a statue of the four children representing the tribes joined in Bavaria. Bavarian, Swabian, Frank, and Falls. The ruler's figure towers above them. The small mountain stream originating in Tyrol crosses the border at Mittenwald, merging the rivers of the Loisach and the Amper, and finally runs into the Danube. Earlier, it threatened the city with several floods. Therefore, dams and water barriers have been built on it. Walking along the bank of the Isar, we can see many beautiful buildings, palaces, and blocks of flats from the last century. The evangelical St. Lucas Church which is currently under reconstruction, is wedged in between them. Its dome and double tower are far taller than the surrounding houses. Its huge rose window reminds us of the French Gothic. Before we reach the Deutsches Museum, built on an island in the Isar, we glimpse the building of Müller's Volksbad. The small palace standing in a well-kept park, in spite of its tower, is not a church, but a bath. Its covered hall is popular among locals all year round. The building was constructed in 1897 by Karl Hochheder, but yet today, it still catches the attention of passers-by. After the two wars, few similar classic bathing buildings remained in Europe. Only the Seychenny bath in Budapest can be compared to the elegancy of the Volksbad. There's also a pleasant garden in front of the building. There are statues and fountains in every park in Munich making the places more attractive for centuries and contributing to the pleasant atmosphere of the city. The Deutsches Museum, despite its name, is really international. The museum was founded in 1903 and today has grown to be one of the most respected scientific technical exhibitions of Europe. The laying of the foundation stone of the building meant for the collection of the engineer Oscar von Miller was in 1904 on one of the islands in the Isar. Emperor William II also participated in the celebration. Gabriel von Seidel had made the plans, but due to his death, the construction was left to his brother, Emmanuel. The Deutsches Museum opened its gates in 1925. The library and the Congress Hall were added three years later. In World War II, the building was seriously damaged, but thanks to the museologist's assiduous work, only 20% of the exhibited objects were ruined. 
Presently, the library consists of 700,000 volumes, and also the technical drawing collection is quite considerable. On the eight floors of the huge maze-like building, we can progress according to categories. The 55 permanent exhibitions occupy 55,000 square meters, and a path 17 kilometers in length goes among the total of 17,000 objects. As this is a rather serious walking tour, it's advised to reduce the program to a limited number of individual fields of interest. Those who want to examine everything in detail can even spend two or three days here. In the first room, we can make ourselves familiar with water power stations and the building of dams and bridges. Large-scale models represent the famous bridges of the world, from ancient wooden constructions to the present-day high-tech bridges. Everyone can try Leonardo's witty water lifter. Though everyone is fascinated by different things, the most popular and most attractive is the hall representing the history of ships where originals and models are both presented. All this is supplemented by pictures, dioramas, and functioning models. We can see the ancestral history of shipping, boats, and rafts of papyrus, as well as famous medieval sailboats. Here are the ships of great explorers and travelers and commercial sailboats, too. We can also go down inside one of the sailboats to feel the significance of the poor, limited circumstances in which sailors had to spend months. We can also visit a luxury ship originating from the beginning of the last century. The deck chairs of the cabins and sunbathing deck are original. Only the screaming of the seagulls is not. We can have a look into the captain's cabin as well, and we can get familiar with the navigation apparatus. Those interested can visit the engine room and have a look at the huge screws and anchors and the tools necessary for repairing them. An excerpt from the Big Book of Sailing reads as follows. In the shipbuilding workshop, a pleasant picture greets the visitor. Already from afar, his nose could sense the strange, but not at all bad mixture of the aromas of water, several kinds of wood, and tar. The pulsating music of the tools and the babel-like cacophony of carpenters, pluggers, rope players, sail makers, and painters are part of this dense atmosphere. Alongside the steaming tar cauldrons, masters and assistants stirring about among the highly stacked piles of boards, here and there serious-faced surveyors emerged, with papers in their hands on which one of the scientific members of the Admiralty had drawn the plans of the ship being built. Large-scale models of several famous sailboats are also exhibited. Besides passenger and commercial ships, we can also see warships and their armament. We can even press ourselves into a genuine World War II submarine. The halls of the history of aviation are no less interesting. The exhibition starts with the German Zeppelin airships, but we can see the model of the Montgolfier brothers balloon and a real hot air balloon of today. Further, there are fighter planes, helicopters, ultralight planes, and rescuer planes. And there's also the plane of the famous German war pilot, the Red Baron.
Leonardo da Vinci planned the predecessor of the hang glider, but centuries passed until a real working one could be born. We can try to find our way among the countless instruments of an airplane cockpit. We can sit and fasten our seat belts in a giant plane, and besides civilian aeronautic devices, we can also become acquainted with military flying. It's too much to list all the topics, but one other example are the several kinds of musical instruments. The Hall of Chemistry shows the evolution of science from medieval alchemy to modern medical science. In the furnished laboratory, wax figures are working. The textile industry has developed from manual labor to computer-controlled factories. The optical industry and photography have also undergone stunning changes. The history of the measurement of time is very interesting from sundials and water meters up to atomic clocks. Here we can see church clocks, wall and table clocks, as well as watches. In the Hall of Astronomy, planet models and films help us to find our way in the universe. We get an overall view of the development of science and technology and can even find a planetarium and observatory in the Tower Building. We can see a sample of Altamira Cave and the tools of prehistoric and ancient ages. From old-timer cars to the vehicles of space travel and research, there are countless things of interest to see. Raw materials, metal processing, the engines, agricultural implements, even the results of archaeology are introduced. St. Maximilian Church is a nice monument on the bank of the Isar, an example of how interesting sites can be found even in less frequented parts of the city. It's good to have a walk in Munich. Many think that the Bavarian capital is all about Oktoberfest, the pretzel, the foaming beers in enormous steins, and glittering stores. However, behind all these, there's another Munich which respects its traditions, and to this end, knows and preserves its past. The city's intellectuality is based on its more than 800-year history. Here are the words of Stefan Georg, a German poet. Walls between a ghost still dares to walk. Land which the double poison could not ruin. City of youth and jolly, my home where the sky rests on the towers of Ladykin. Although Bavaria today is only one province of Germany, we can still feel everywhere that it's different from the other German provinces. Dr. Klaus Andreas writes, After World War II, the Bavarian capital surpassed all German cities with its high number of immigrants. Considering the number of guest nights, it's on the same level as Rome, 
Paris, Vienna, and London. The reason for it is probably also the atmosphere of the city, where life can be lived obviously more freely, in a more human way, more carelessly, more lightly, and more consciously than in any other German city. The secret of the city's attraction is also that here the contrasts are folded into each other and the extremes coexist peacefully alongside each other. Those visiting here soon agree with these ideas. Many people might be familiar with the park extending behind the Bavaria Ring, as Oktoberfest is held here every year in autumn. For the beer festival, incredible crowns come together to taste the beer specialties in the pavilions, huge beer tents, or just under the open sky. Who else could glance down at the typically Bavarian celebration than the female character standing for the whole country, the statue of Bavaria? The statue is 30 meters high together with its base. One hand of the body is resting on a lion's mane, the other one is lifting up a laurel wreath. Inside, 130 stairs lead up to the head where we can look out over Theresa Field through the eye sockets and locks of the hair. The statue was dedicated in 1850 and, by the way, was made of the material of seized Turkish cannons. The planner was Ludwig Schwanthaler and the technician was Ferdinand von Miller. The Bavaria statue is surrounded on three sides by the Hall of Glory. Statues of famous Bavarian people are placed under the Doric pillars. Here stand Ludwig I, Rudolf Diesel, the brewer Josef Schor, and the actress Clara Ziegler. On October 17, 1810, in honor of the wedding of heir apparent to the throne, Louis, and Therese von Hildburghausen, a horse race was held on the field. The festival was such a success that since then, it's held every year. First, the horse races and shooting competitions stood in the center of the festival. Nowadays, the spotlight is on beer, and the younger generation is entertained by roller coasters, the Ferris wheel, and the merry-go-round. In 16 days, more than 5 million people visit the event, and these people drink about 4 million liters of beer. Königsplatz came alive by initiative of Ludwig I. The Propyläen, which is a Greek-styled city gate decorated with columns, was conceived by him. The building, made as a copy of the Acropolis in Athens, was aimed to remind everyone that the son of Ludwig, Otto, was a Greek king. However, his kingdom didn't last long. Soon after the dedication of the statue, the Greek Revolution chased him away. The court architect, Leo von Klenze planned the gate, and it forms a close unit with the other two buildings standing on the square. These are also Greek-styled, pillared, arcaded tympanum palaces, which in Germany have primarily been built for museum purposes. The Glyptothek, meaning statue collection, is standing on the left side, exhibiting Greek and Roman statues. At its opening, both originals and copies were here. After the devastation of World War II, at the reopening, only original works were placed here. Ludwig I and his son bought the statues. The Egineta statue group, the Tenea Apollo, and the Barbarian Fawn are especially famous. The square, which was dreamed and planned in that same time, was completed in three phases between 1813 and 1861. The art gallery standing opposite is called Antikensammlung today and is an ancient collection featuring Greek statuettes and ancient treasures. Besides, temporary exhibitions are also displayed here and the reduced copy of the Troy wooden horse refers to that. Opposite the gate and a bit farther away is the obelisk on Karolinenplatz, of the same age as the square and constructed in memory of the 30,000 Bavarian soldiers who died in the Russian drive when they were forced by their ruler to fight on Napoleon's side.
The Sega Store, however, is a triumphal arch for those soldiers who died when battling against Napoleon. Also, the facade sign says this, den Bayerischen Heere, meaning for the Bavarian Army. The gate was modeled after the Constantinus triumphal arch in Rome. The construction, decorated with Corinthian pillars, reliefs, and winged statues, was the last work of Gärtner, and he died before its dedication. Only in the year of the Olympic Games of 1972 could the four lions be placed back on top of the triumphal arch, which was damaged in the war. The wise comment of Wilhelm Hausenstein can be read on it. It was dedicated to victory, damaged in the war, and beckons to peace. In 1965, in Rome, the right of organizing the Olympic Games was awarded to Munich. The planning lasted for four years in the Benish & Company Architectural Studio. The ceremonial laying of the foundation stone was in June 1969. Munich was bombed to the ground during the war and cleverly made use of the neglected field where so far only debris had been accumulating. Rudolf Belling's six-meter-high work called Peace Monument was erected on top of the 52-meter-high recultivated hill. The big stadium is quite a special sight. Its grandstands are protected by wavy acrylic glass fastened on a steel framework. The 75,000-square-meter tent roof is a unique technical solution. Its supporting cables are stretched on steel columns with a height which varies between 12 and 81 meters. With its budget of 168 million German marks, it was the most expensive in the modern history of the Olympics. The stadium can hold 78,000 spectators, while the similarly looking multifunctional sport hall has a capacity of 14,000. The 290 meter high Olympic Tower rises above the park. An express lift goes up to its restaurant, which provides a wonderful panorama. The formation of the Olympic Village is also interesting and can even be exemplary for the future. On the surface, there are no roads for vehicles, just pedestrian zones, bicycle paths and parks. Cars can reach the underground garages through passages. The multi-story housing of the Olympic Village, where the sportsmen were accommodated, have been sold as flats, while the single-story houses for the women have become a dormitory for 1,800 students. The Olympic swimming pool has five pools and can hold 6,000 people, as can the ice skating rink and the bicycle stadium. This enormous amount of work and money were almost made futile when terrorists pulled off a violent attack against Israeli athletes. Until September 11, 2001, no further such brutal incident has occurred in the civilized world. Steven Spielberg's film, entitled Munich, is about this terrorist attack. Among the hills, an 85-square-meter artificial lake was made from the dammed-up channel. A special open-air stage is situated on the lake. The stage floats on the lake, while the audience of 3,000 sits in a semicircular amphitheater around the lake. World War II and the period leading up to it belong to the history of Bavaria. After Hitler's rise to power, the first concentration camp was established in Dachau, 18 kilometers from Munich. The first prisoners were not necessarily Jews, but rather political enemies of the government. In 1933, after Adolf Hitler's appointment to Chancellor, the Imperial Assembly was dissolved and more than 10,000 people were arrested on the fake charge that they had set the Reichstag building on fire. They, and later a further 300,000 Germans, became the first prisoners of war. After the war, the series of events accelerated. Millions of people from occupied territories were closed in here. 
It was already not about separation or imprisonment, but mass genocide. The people had to serve as slaves and were driven into cabins camouflaged as showers where poison gases killed them, and they were then annihilated in crematoriums. Towards the end of the war, new ovens were put in use. The camp was declared a national memorial in 1965. In part of the remaining barracks, exhibitions are set up where mainly black and white photos remind us of the atrocities of the Third Reich. On the central grounds is the work of Yugoslavian sculptor Gild Nandor. The sculpture is made of fence posts, barbed wire, and wire skeletons expressing the desperation, death throes, the longing for freedom, and the will for existence. The other work of art, a glass sculpture of several stars of David, was made in Israel. The Christ Suffering Chapel was built in 1955 to give visiting family members a worthy place for mourning, remembering, and prayer. The cylinder, made of rubble stone, opens up like a shell and has a stylized wreath of thorns above it. It's interesting to discover the differences between Auschwitz in Poland and the German Dachau. As far as the functions and dreadful things are concerned, there were no differences between the two camps. The bigger difference is between the two memorials. While Poland, from where the majority of the victims came, established a heartbreaking museum where we can see human hair, glasses, false teeth, and artificial hands taken from the prisoners, the Germans, who perhaps feel embarrassed, show a cold memorial which demonstrates distance. Huge empty areas sprinkled with pebbles, rows of trees, nothing personal. Nothing is hidden here, nothing has been dismantled. Even the stoves are standing, and yet it's if they were trying to make light of what had happened with unemotional objectivity. Would this memorial be standing decades later, when the last family members are also dead? Prince Elector Ferdinand Maria presented the farm at the western side of Munich to his wife on the occasion of the birth of their child. The Wittelsbachs primarily used Nymphenburg Castle as a summer residence. The family's ancestor was Marquis Luitpold, who died in the battle against the Hungarians at Banhida in 907. The Bittelsbachs gave several rulers to Bavaria. Another of their late descendants was the Austrian Emperor and Hungarian Queen Elizabeth, also known as Sissi. The owners asked Italian artists to plan the buildings and the surrounding park. The middle wing is the work of Barelli and Zucali. The Nymphenburger Channel flows for one and a half kilometers up to the main entrance and then flows through the geometric center of the park. Three smaller castles are located in the park. The most well-known is Princess Amelia's charming women's hunting seat. Badenburg, or bathing castle, on the shore of the larger lake is also famous. Musicians serenaded the illustrious group of bathers from the balcony of the building. The musicians chosen were blind because the lords were bathing naked. The gallery in Maximilian Emanuel's bedroom, consisting of nine pictures, represents those ladies with whom he had a closer relationship during his exile to France. The picture series ordered by Ludwig I gave even more work to the royal painter, Joseph Stieler. 
among the 36 pictures of identical size, there's also the portrait of the famous dancer of those days, Lola Montez. In the former stables, the ornamental coaches of the dynasty are exhibited. In the northern round bastion, Nymphenburg porcelain is produced. During the summer festival, Baroque and Rococo music can be heard in the ceremonial hall and the park. <laughs> 